My name is Renaud Purifoy, and this is the first in a series of videos dealing with anger. In this video, I describe what anger is along with the role that it plays in your daily life. In the videos that follow, I'll discuss ways to manage anger so it becomes a constructive rather than a destructive force in your life. Let's begin with the basic definition for anger. Anger is one of two emotional responses that can be triggered by a perceived threat. The other is fear. The thing that determines whether you experience fear or anger is your perception of whether or not you will be able to manage the threat. If the threat is seen as manageable, you experience anger and are motivated to eliminate the threat. If the threat is seen as unmanageable, you experience fear and the desire to escape from or avoid the threat. Keep in mind that your interpretation of a situation as a threat, as well as your perception of your ability to deal with the threat, is subjective. They are the result of your beliefs and the experiences you have had in similar situations in the past. It's also important to note that much of this assessment is done very quickly at an unconscious level. Indeed, since many of the daily threats human faced in the past were deadly, this ability to assess potential threats quickly and automatically has been essential for human survival. If you would like to learn more about this process, along with emotions other than anger, I recommend the video titled, Why Do We Have Emotions? The rest of this video will focus on anger. The other thing to note is that the word anger, as used in this video series, is used to cover what are normally thought of as a wide range of emotions. These range from simple irritation to out-of-control rage. While the word anger usually just refers to the middle level of intensity, the entire range is actually just different levels of intensity for one basic emotion, anger. Now, let's look at three common myths about anger. The first myth is the idea that it's healthy to vent anger. Many people believe that venting anger, either verbally or physically, is healthy, if not essential for emotional well-being. This is not true. While venting anger can have value in a limited number of situations during therapy, it's usually not productive in everyday life. There are two reasons for this. First, venting anger tends to increase the level of anger you're experiencing. Second, the increased level of anger that you're experiencing, like any strong emotion, interferes with your ability to think in a logical and rational manner. Anger, then, is an emotion that needs to be acted on, not acted out. What I mean by this is that anger is simply a message that you perceive a threat of some kind. The most appropriate response is to identify the threat clearly and develop a plan to deal with it. Because strong emotion reduces your ability to think rationally, venting anger tends to result in inappropriate and self-defeating actions. This, in turn, interferes with your ability to meet the need that was threatened effectively. The second myth about anger is the idea that responding to anger with aggression is instinctual and can't be helped. Several popular books have argued that violent behavior is a genetically programmed part of human nature. But the consensus of research is that this is not true. While emotions are part of our genetic makeup, the specific emotion that is triggered in a given situation is determined by our interpretation of the event, whether a need is being met or threatened, or whether a loss has occurred. More importantly, the behaviors we exhibit in response to our emotions are, for the most part, learned. While one person may tend to become angry and aggressive, another tends to become passive, while yet another may experience anxiety or depression. While the idea that I was just born this way is often used as an excuse for poor anger management, it is not true. The way you behave when angry was learned. The third myth about anger is the idea that it's normal to become angry when frustrated, helpless, or confused. Each of these situations could trigger anger, or fear, sadness, or no response. 
The particular emotion you experience is determined by your interpretation of the event, and it's not always anger. Frustration simply means that a need or desire is not being met. Helplessness is the inability to do something necessary to meet a desire or need. When you are stuck in a traffic jam, your ability to go as fast as you want is frustrated. Plus, you are helpless in that there is nothing you can do to correct the situation. While many people do become angry in response to this type of frustration and helplessness, many others do not. Again, it's your interpretation of the event that determines what emotion is triggered. If you think, I can't stand this. Why does this always happen to me? You'll probably become angry. If instead you think, here's another one of our famous traffic jams. I guess I might as well relax and enjoy some music on the radio. You'll probably remain calm. Confusion results from not understanding something. If you are trying to complete a complex tax form and do not understand it, you are confused. However, anger is not the only possible response. You could respond to the confusing form with anxiety instead of anger. Both anger and anxiety are possible since a failure to pay taxes can result in a real and well-defined threat. In contrast, a riddle or joke that causes confusion might cause you to laugh once it's understood. This response is also normal since this type of confusion is a form of play. At the same time, the confusing plot of a mystery novel might provoke only a heightened interest. Since the confusion of a mystery novel is expected and a form of recreation, little emotion other than interest is expected. Thus, confusion can trigger a variety of responses depending upon whether our needs are being met, as with a joke or mystery novel, or threatened, as with a tax form. Now that we've looked at three common myths about anger, let's look at three ways that anger helps you to meet a threat. First, anger prepares the body for action by triggering what is commonly called the fight or flight response. This response increases activity in your muscles, heart, lungs, and other systems that are required for action. At the same time, it quiets activity in systems such as your digestive system that would reduce your ability to respond with physical action. The stronger the emotion, the more intense the response. This is why people sometimes shake or become flushed when very angry. It's also what gives you the feeling of increased strength as anger triggers the release of hormones that prepare your muscles for action. The second thing that anger does is focus your attention on the perceived threat. Again, the more intense the emotion, the more focused you become. The third action triggered by anger is an urge to take action to eliminate the threat. To see how these three things work together, consider a football coach giving a pregame pep talk to his team. As he fires up the team members against their opponents, their emotions trigger the fight or flight response, providing them with extra strength and stamina that they can feel in their bodies. The strong emotion also focuses their minds on the game. Thoughts of grades and girlfriends, doubts and fears, all fade into the background. The players thereby gain a greater sense of confidence in their ability to crush their opposition. The sense of their being on a righteous mission makes the goal of winning the only thing that matters. Now the energy, focus, and motivation produced by anger can be expressed in any one of four ways. The first possible response is to suppress your anger and do nothing as you try to ignore it. For example, Carmen was asked to work overtime on a day when it would cause her to be late for a family gathering she had been looking forward to. Because she was non-assertive, she refrained from speaking up and explaining to her supervisor that she had a special event planned. Instead, she swallowed her anger and smiled as she said, No problem. She honestly thought that everything was fine. Later, however, she developed a headache, and when she did eventually arrive at the event, she found it difficult to enjoy herself. 
The second possible response is to ignore the original threat that triggered the anger and focus on a real or imagined personal weakness or inadequacy. Alex's girlfriend canceled the date he had planned. As he became angry, he began to think, I guess I'm not really that important. I've been stupid to think that someone like her could really care for me. A third possibility is to shift your focus from the original threat and direct your anger at someone or something unrelated to it. This is common when the original threat is perceived as too dangerous to confront. Due to an error by his supervisor, David lost an account he had worked hard to secure. Upon hearing what had happened, he said nothing to the supervisor. Instead, he criticized his secretary about an unrelated, trivial matter. The fourth possible response is to focus on the threat that triggered your anger and take action to eliminate the threat. This can be done in an appropriate or an inappropriate way. People with poor anger management skills tend to do this in an ineffective and overly aggressive way that damages relationships and keeps them from getting what they want. People with good anger management skills address needs, threats, and losses in a way that minimizes them with the least amount of harm to themselves and others. Sharon's co-worker was habitually late in getting a weekly report to her. This caused Sharon to be late in completing her assignments. To resolve this, Sharon took the co-worker aside in private and explained how important the report was and how not getting it on time was affecting her ability to do her job. She then restated when the report was needed for her to complete her work. Now let's look more closely at the difference between appropriate and inappropriate anger. Anger is appropriate when a real threat exists, when the level of your anger is proportional to the threat, and when your actions effectively reduce the threat with the least amount of harm to yourself and others. From this simple definition, we can see that anger can be inappropriate in any one of three ways. First, you may become angry when there is no logical reason to become angry. For example, suppose you purchase a candy bar from a vending machine. Upon opening the package, you find that the candy bar is broken instead of being in one whole piece. Since the candy bar tastes the same and you received the full amount you paid for, you weren't cheated. Any reaction greater than mild disappointment would be inappropriate. The second form of inappropriate anger is anger whose intensity is out of proportion to events. Say you put money into the vending machine but receive nothing. To become annoyed or mildly angry would be reasonable since the satisfaction of a need has been threatened and a loss has occurred. To become enraged would be inappropriate. The third form involves inappropriate behaviors triggered by anger. If you receive nothing from the vending machine, it would be appropriate to try to find someone to reimburse you for the lost money or to tap the machine firmly a few times to try to unstick the mechanism but to intentionally damage the machine or scream at the vendor would be inappropriate. Inappropriate emotional responses sometimes have organic causes. Injury to the brain, disease, drugs, or an inherited genetic defect can cause your nervous system to function improperly. This can generate exaggerated emotional responses and interfere with your ability to interpret events accurately. However, most emotions that occur when events don't warrant it, or at a greater level of intensity than is appropriate, are usually due to some sort of irrational thinking. Inappropriate actions are usually the result of learning that took place during childhood. Thus, effective anger control requires both minimizing irrational thinking that generates inappropriate anger and learning how to respond appropriately when you become angry. This means that there are three general areas that need to be addressed for effective anger management. 
The first area of anger management focuses on managing the level of anger you're experiencing. Those who go to a high level of anger very quickly need to learn how to stop and cool down before deciding on a plan of action. This usually involves training that uses a behavioral approach. The second area of anger management focuses on reducing anger that is triggered when no real threat exists or occurs at a level that is out of proportion to the threat. The three sources for this are irrational and unrealistic beliefs and expectations, habitual ways of thinking that distort reality, and unconscious emotional triggers from the past. Work in one or more of these areas is often very beneficial. The third area focuses on learning appropriate actions you can take when angry. These are then practiced until they become automatic and replace old, inappropriate, aggressive responses. This often takes the form of assertiveness training. Each of these areas is explored in more detail separately in the next three videos in this series. All of the information in this video has been taken from the book Anger, Taming the Beast. Clicking on the image of the book takes you to more information about it. Clicking on the subscription button takes you to the home page of my channel where you will find videos on other topics as well as information on this and other books. Clicking on Next takes you to the next video in this series. Thank you for viewing my presentation. I hope it has helped you understand what anger is and why we become angry more fully. If it has, please click on the like button before leaving.